just as a little introduction, um, you know, that the, uh, you know, the spinal cord injury is a major public health problem also. It's a major clinical challenge, but it's also a major public health problem because of the profound impacts it has on the people. And then, you know, beyond the, as, as we all know, beyond the supportive care uh, and you know, emergency surgery and a little of the uh, conflicting evidence about the use of corticosteroids, we really don't have much of the uh, choices how to treat this injury and various uh, treatments have been attempted and the, none, of, none of them has shown any success yet. So uh, one of the possibilities or opportunities to try to uh, do something with the acute spinal cord injury and its consequences is the neuroprotection and the one of the best known uh, pharmaceutical treatments for, uh, in this area is the sodium channel broker or rilozole. And as you know, rilozole has been approved for the amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. And uh, it has been since, uh, you know, the expectations are high and it has been tested for various, you know, dementia, depression, uh, anxiety disorders. Uh, and again, a little bit of very, very, uh, uh, results out of it, but it's definitely something that is that is high on the agenda of the expectations. The, uh, you know, there was some uh, uh, you know, preclinical studies that uh, based on the RAT models, and they were quite promising on the you know, inducing a spinal cord injury in the RAT model, and then uh, seeing the how the uh, recovery goes under stress condition has been quite promising and that has led into the phase one clinical trial uh, of the Rilazole that has been completed in 2011 in which 36 patients uh, have been uh, administered Rilazole that was the open label trial and then the control group was the Registry Nectin. Registry Nectin is the North American Clinical Trials Network uh, that is supported by the Christopher Reeve Foundation and the Department of Defense. Uh, they, they run a registry and they, they use the historical controls out of that registry to uh, get the pr preliminary evidence uh, uh, about the relazole. I mean, primarily it was the question of tolerability, but also there was a question of the early evidence of the efficacy. And this is the population from that uh, study population from that phase one trial. And the, when they were matched with the uh, historical controls from the registry, this is how it looked like. So so you can see the segregation at about, you know, 42 and 90 days. It starts a little closing at 180 days. But the, again, as I'm saying, this was not a randomized comparison, but it was to uh, viewed as the promising. That has led to the idea about launching a phase three trial to really see if the Rilazole uh, is effective or not. And the, that was really spearheaded by the Aerospine North America, which I'm sure you have heard a lot about, uh, where Jens is a prominent uh, uh, member. And the, so the, so so those, that thinking started around in 2011, and, with, and I was in the, at that time got involved with uh, assisting in uh, setting up the design of that study. The, uh, so the study, uh, you know, started at the uh, in the with the plan of having the enough power to enroll both the you know phase. A and phase B, uh, uh, Asia A and Asia B. Uh, I'm sorry, I just need to pull. Something is somehow got wrong with these slides. I'm sorry. Okay, finally, now I have the 
the right ones. So the uh, so the initial you know wish for the trial was to to have enough power to to so both the Asia A and Asia B patients because the initial evidence has shown that the uh, that the that there is a different potentially different response uh, based on the initial Asia status. So the concern was if we, if we enroll you know, a mixture of Asia A's and Asia B, depends on what that mixture is going to be, we may not have enough power to actually show the effect. So, so we went into the having enough power also for the subgroup um, analysis, and they, that has led to uh, you know, setting up this trial. Uh, we did, I'll go over the trial characteristics and then show you where we are now and what are the experiences so far. So the aim is to evaluate the efficacy and safety of Rilazole and the, the dosing is in the duration of 14 days and the first dose is like a bolus dose of two times 100 milligrams. The standard dose of Rilazole is 100 milligrams a day. So, so we, we use the, uh, the, you know, the first dose of two times 100 milligram. And then after that, it's, uh, you know, two times 50 milligrams daily for the remain, reminder of the 13 days. In, in this, you know, assumed mechanism, if it works, then it has to work very early. The idea is that it's going to work on the secondary injury from the toxic uh, contact uh, that is uh, dispersed in the injury environment during the acute injury, and that the neuroprotector will then protect the cells from getting these toxic substances in, and the, and the, in that way to preserve the what can be salvaged uh, during that the spinal cord injuries but in order for that to work it has to be administered quite quickly and that's one of the logistical challenges that the the time window has been opened up to 12 hours since the injuries that means that includes all the time in the transportation of the patient to the hospital and then getting him and getting him enrolled and they um, evaluated pre-screened and then administered the first dose of the drug within that that 12 hour window, which is a necessity for this trial, but it definitely poses the logistical challenges uh, to the study. Uh, the, it is a randomized uh, trial. Uh, the, uh, it's you know, double blinded. We have placebo pills there. The PI for this trial is Dr. Michael Failings from the University of Toronto. Um, the primary efficacy endpoint is the, is the change in the Asia or the international classification total motor score between 180 days and baseline that has been uh, viewed because the, the Earlier studies have shown that around 180 days, the Asia doesn't change much after that. There is still some small change up to 12 months, but not that much. So the six months has been viewed as the uh, as a sufficient uh, uh, time period to evaluate the safety and efficacy of this treatment. And then the secondary endpoints, uh, all the other aspects of the Asia scale, uh, the uh, sensory and change in the Asia grade. And then we are also collecting the uh, general health related quality of life, the SF36, the uh, then health utilities, EQ5D, um, numeric rating scale for pain. Uh, then there is an instrument called grade, which is based on the you know, motor strength uh, on grasping the uh, something with the hand. So, so what, We'll see that the uh, the follow-up schedule is as follow is you know there is an evaluation at the time when the patient arrives to the hospital uh, and that is you know screening and enrollment uh, at that time then the uh, surgery and majority of these patients do get surgery uh, then we have the the 
fixed point, which is at 72 hours post injury, which is established, which is another Asia evaluation, because that has been shown that at that time it's more stable. The, the very early measurements can vary then and change a lot depending on how many hours have, have been since the injury. And then at seven and 14 days, uh, uh, this 14 days is also, just also to share a little of the logistical aspects, is sometimes challenging because the in various countries and various uh, systems, the patients do get transferred out of the acute care earlier than 14 days in majority of situations, but then we need to continue administering the drug. And the question is, where are they transferred and how do you capture them? Uh, it, it just it has been a big logistical issue for the study. The, and then there's the 84 days, 180 days, which is primary endpoint, and then one year and the patients, all the patients will be followed up to one year until the last patient reaches six months. Uh, altogether, uh, we need 351 subjects to have enough statistical power for what I have mentioned and they, they randomized one to one to Rylazole and, and the placebo arms. The, the uh, Original plan, uh, as you can see it here, was to uh, start in 2013, and the uh, very optimistic um, you know, assumptions at that time were that the enrollment will complete in 30 months. The, um, as you will see later, that was the over-optimistic. It's not easy to enroll in the spinal cord injury trials, and many of the trials that were running around, like for example, I don't know if you have heard about the myocycline trial, uh, which was run in, in Canada and involved some countries around the world, and several industry trials that are currently running, they're facing major challenges on on getting the patients enrolled. And that's a, there's several reasons for it. One is that the uh, you know, luckily the spinal cord injury is, uh, the incidence of spinal cord injury is declining. I don't know if you have observed that in your facility, but simply, uh, you know, the, the roads are safer, the cars are safer, the environment is safer, and we do see on the, on the you know, public health level that there are less and less spinal cord injuries. Uh, so uh, that is one aspect. The other as aspect is that there are more centers that are treating them, which spreads the population around. Uh, and, and so all the centers are, are seeing less spinal cord injuries. Then not every subject is, of course, eligible for the trial. And that, that starts bringing the potential numbers to very, very low. We, we are running the international trial and having sites in Australia and looking for sites in the um, in Europe. Uh, currently have 21 sites open. The, the several, there are certain countries which have a very high incidence of spinal cord injury, uh, like India and China, and those would be the ideal places to recruit the patients. However, again, there are logistical challenges with this. Um, India has uh, introduced very strict and, and somewhat contradictory regulations when it comes to the subject injury insurance. So all the sponsors have simply abandoned. Uh, there is no way to run the study currently in India. It's almost impossible to sponsors to meet those subject injury uh, insurance requirements. While the while the approach in in majority of the continental China to the spinal cord injury is that the patients are treated locally and then, you know. They're, they're transferred to the central place with a with this significant delay of two to three days. And of course, that doesn't work for us. So it's almost impossible to get the patient within 12 hours. So those countries, therefore, who have the still the larger number of these injuries are not uh, helpful in, in getting this uh, study done. Here are the you know, list of the inclusion exclusion uh, criteria uh, for this study. Uh, I'm not going to go in details of those. There, there are some drugs, Rilazole is well tolerated, uh, but there are certain interactions, some inhibitors, and then um, some of the inducers that need to be avoided. Uh, nothing of that uh, place is a very uh, significant challenge for the study. Uh, 
because of this large sample size and prolonged, there will be an interim analysis at about 60% of this 351, at which time we'll see if the, you know, if the drug doesn't have any effect and the study will stop for the futility, but also at that time we can see the early efficacy and see if that original estimate of 351 has been correct or do we need to do uh, something else. Here's the schedule of the um, examinations and as I said, as you can see these here, here you can see the follow-ups and the various uh, evaluations that are performed on it. Currently, as I said, we have 21 open sites actively enrolling. We started, uh, the first patient was enrolled in November of 2013 and the, uh, we, are, we have 21 open sites and here are the you know, names of the, try to bring that a little larger, uh, yeah, of the current investigators, and I'm sure that you recognize many uh, many of the names here. And then and then we are working with four more sites. Uh, at the moment, we have 98 subjects. This table shows 91. Those are the data that are validated in the database. So, uh, so we're not showing the data for the seven others that are not in. So 98 subjects, uh, and as I said, it's a relatively slow enrollment. Uh, if we started in 2013, now we're in 2017. So, so the current projections are that this study will end up enrollment somewhere in 2023-24. That's the... However, with 98 subjects enrolled, it is by far the largest spinal cord injury study randomized control trial since 1990, since corticosteroids have been uh, tested in the trials. No other uh, study has managed to enroll more than 30 subjects since uh, because of the logistical challenges. So, so this is one of the studies if, you know, pending any kind of major events. It is one of the studies which we really hope is going to bring the result, whatever the result is going to be, but it's going to, it's going to succeed. And, and the, the reason I'm mentioning these logistical aspects is also uh, because it, it, it brings two things. It brings the results about the real result, but it also brings the, some logistical information about how to run these studies at all, because as I said, there has been about five, six, seven studies that attempted to be phase three studies, and they all just stopped at this, uh, this time for the lack of enrollment. Uh, so, so that's the, you know, just a little about the population. As we know, it's dominantly male patient population. Uh, the uh, the distribution by race is here. More most interesting is this is the distribution by the Asia uh, grades A, B, and C, uh, and then the uh, you know the initial score was the 18 on the scale to 100 for the Asia motor score. So these are quite serious injuries, uh, and the we don't we don't have any efficacy information, the study is blinded and no efficacy information will be evaluated prior to reaching the 60% of the sample, which is going to be later in, in around 2020. Uh, the, um, the, on these large studies, there are also some smaller studies that are piggybacking, like the uh, we have a study, sub-study or, or piggyback study on the looking at the specific uh, possibilities to use the MRI to both the diagnose, uh, to, to make the prediction of how likely is that the patient will recover. So if, if the initial MRI can be used and analyzed in some way that, the, that can be predictive of what's going to be the final recovery, those studies haven't shown much results until now, uh, but we are, we are looking at the uh, and the specific aspects of that. And then there is also a sub-study on the pharmacology of rilosol, which runs along this to see if there will be a possibility to see if, if there is you know, some dose response based on the compliance from the patients. And then also the different patients have, of course, different uptake of rilosol and this injury. And the question is if that concentration of rilosol that has been achieved in, in the blood is correlated in any way to the injury response. Um, I'll stop here to leave a little time for the 
questions or discussion. Great. Thank you. <laughs>